Hello, I'm Carol Fleck, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation titled, Getting Ready to Launch, Setting Up Middle and High School Students for Success and Independence. Due to technical limitations, today's expert speaker has joined us by audio and with slides. The transition from middle school to high school, from high school to college and beyond is not just a step forward, it's a leap. It's a big transition for any student, but it can be especially daunting for parents and kids with ADHD whose emotional maturity and executive function skills may be delayed by a few years. In today's webinar, caregivers will learn strategies that build their students' executive function skills. We'll address issues like helping students to initiate work independently, managing long-term projects, setting realistic expectations, and submitting work on time. Leading today's presentation is Chris Dendy. Chris has been recognized nationally as a leader in the ADH field, ADHD field for more than 50 years. Her experience has spanned many roles, including author and speaker, classroom teacher, school psychologist, mental health counselor, local and state mental health administrator, a national mental health consultant on children's issues. Chris was inducted into the Chad Hall of Fame in 2006 and was later honored with the organization's Lifetime Achievement Award. She has written four books, including her latest, Launching into Young Adulthood with ADHD, Ready or Not, which she co-authored with Ruth Hughes. Before I hand over the microphone to Chris, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned in to the live webinar may submit questions for the expert at any time by navigating to the text box under the video player. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 425 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Subscribe now to receive the upcoming winter issue which features a special holiday survival guide to help ADHD families cope with unwelcome advice from relatives, how to navigate treatment when households are separated by divorce, as well as an article written by Chris Dendy that you can tear out and give to your child's teacher about practical tips to solve behavior challenges at school. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Equizen Pro. Equizen Pro is a clinically proven nutritional medical food designed to help improve focus, attention, academic performance, and balanced mood for those with ADHD. Clinical studies have shown Equizen Pro can improve ADHD symptoms in as little as 12 weeks. Now is the perfect time to start supporting your child's mind and get them ready for back to school. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Chris Dendy. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion. Hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here and always am honored when Attitude staff invite me to present a webinar, and I'm so glad you've joined us. And as Carol explained, I'll be speaking to you from two perspectives. One is as a professional with everything that she mentioned, teacher, school psychologist, et cetera, but also the parent of three grown children and now five grown grandchildren who have dealt with and coped with ADHD and been successful. So one of the tips I'm giving you as parents and, treat and professionals, teachers too, is that in order to build success, you have to understand these following issues. You have to understand how important executive skills are you have to understand the delay in brain maturity. You have to have realistic expectations that match their ability. And you need to be aware of common learning disabilities. 
You need to do whatever it takes to ensure school success, and you need to know the risk of prematurely launching uh, to college right after high school and the benefits of medication. Let me go into some deep brief comments here. Executive skills are key, and this is why I didn't realize this at first, but the challenges that your children and young teens are facing in middle and high school are the same challenges they're going to face in college and at work. So that's why it's so important for you to understand this and to work and implement the strategies that I've identified in the following slides. For example, I view these executive skills as keys for success. And you know, if your son is like mine, being on time was hard, remembering assignments, getting started, initiating work independently, setting priorities, being organized, completing long-term projects, submitting work on time, all of these were huge challenges. And guess what? This, these same challenges will appear in the work world and at college. And so that's why I'm encouraging you to practice these with your, with your children. Um, I have known young ADHD adults who have been fired from jobs for being consistently late. Um, I show you this ADHD iceberg that my son and I created some 20 years ago because it shows you how complex ADHD is. Um, you can't really see this very clearly here, but I can send you to two sources. One is you can download this iceberg free from my website. And secondly, a few years ago, I worked with Attitude, and uh, Carly said she would make that available uh, to develop uh, an iceberg that's um, modified from this one and was intended to specifically for teachers. But... The big thing is that there are things hidden beneath the surface that we don't always associate with ADHD. And that is, for example, the delayed brain maturity. One of the issues is sleep issues. Half of our children have sleep issues, have trouble falling asleep and waking up. So do visit my website and check out and download that free um, iceberg. I also have iceberg seven different translations of course, Spanish is one of those that I've included. Um, one of the most important things you need to know is that the brain matures from back to front. And unfortunately, the front of the brain is the last to mature. Thus, our children experience a five-year delay in the development of these key skills. And look at what they are. They are essential to doing well in school, paying attention, having a memory, controlling your impulses, reasoning, logic, problem solving, planning ahead, goal setting. Our students with ADHD, many of them are delayed in development of these skills. All right, you have one issue of the physical structure of the brain being delayed in maturity, but that impacts your performance. In other words, your developmental skills. So we expect, I expect in my 12-year-old son to be able to remember his assignments and bring his books home from school. I, I never thought or realized that developmentally his maturity was more on a nine or 10-year level. So that means that they are having problems with organization, um, working independently, and controlling their emotions. So here are some examples of our late bloomers. But the good news is our students and children do blossom. Um, the couple on the left, uh, one is my son, Alex, and his wife, Haley, and they're working in real estate now. And I have to laugh because when he was in high school, I shed bucket, buckets of tears. He was gifted and failing six of seven classes his freshman year. And I thought, oh my gosh, he is never going to graduate from high school. He's never going to get a job. He's going to live with us the rest of his life. But the good news is he is successful today. We just have to hang in there with our kids and support them. The one young man next to him is Sean. And he, I asked him once, I said, um, why do you think you're failing in high school? And he said, I guess because I'm lazy. 
So one of the important things we have to do is educate our children and teens about ADHD so that they don't think they're lazy. And the young man on the right is Lewis, and you will hear more about him. He is he once said in our team video, he said, I used to get punished for talking in class, and now I get paid to do it because at the time he was a DJ for at a major Atlanta radio station. So we have to help our children find their strength. Um, I had to reassess my expectations. My son was gifted, and I thought, you know, I did well. You should be able to do well, too. And what I realized is because of the delay in brain maturity that he is developmentally was behind. Unfortunately, we didn't have the research then that we have today, and, and it puzzles me. You know, why is this smart kid not doing well? Independence will come with time, and it's kind of like you're working to build a bridge so that he can, he or she can become more independent. Um, one of the things that amazed me is people would say to me, Chris, your son is so smart. If he would just try harder. And then I found out that IQ is not the best predictor of school success. It's the executive skill known as working memory. And research has shown that a child with good working memory, that's a better predictor of academic success. So that's a key area for you as a parent or a teacher to work on. Maybe not to, uh, primarily to help them develop compensatory strategies to deal with that. One of the things that Russell Barkley says is that the ADHD working memory is unreliable. And that's a huge issue. In other words, your brain talking to yourself that should be sending you a message that says you need to get started on your homework just never quite makes it and never comes through. You never hear it if you have ADHD. So we have to use external reminders to help them remember either a clock or a phone or post-it note or a friend, a parent, uh, a grandfather, whatever it takes. Now there is some good news, but I always feel badly in a way because most of you have young adults that are in their teens up to maybe early 20s. Um, the good news is that their brain's continuing to mature, even beginning in the 20s and on into the 30s and 40s. So you will see continued improvement. In other words, the child, the person that your child is today is not going to be the same person five years or 10 years from now, and their skills are going to be much improved. One of the gurus of information about the brain and executive function is Dr. Martha Dankla, a pediatric neurologist at Kennedy Krieger. And she actually, this is a graph from her book, talks about how executive functions roll out over time. And people would often say to me, okay, if our children are delayed maturity by two to three to five years, will they ever catch up? And I think Dr. Dankla shares the best advice. They will continue to improve until it's good enough for life. Because a lot of the challenges in school will not be challenges in the work world because our youth tend to select careers that are more favorable and match their skills and interests. I'm a former teacher, school psychologist, and mental health counselor, but this is one of the things I've learned. Succeeding in school is one of the most therapeutic things that can happen to a child. It is therapeutic. A child who is doing well in school is not going to be a behavior problem. So you need to do whatever it takes to help your child succeed. So how are, what are some ways that you can ensure school success? First of all, you as a parent or teacher need to identify your, the student's learning and executive function challenges. One of the other downloads from my website is a blank iceberg, and you then can compare the blank iceberg with the one you print out and identify which challenges are specific to your child. Um, the other thing is to practice skills and 
teach compensatory strategies. A lot of times I don't like to use the word teach because if you say teach, that would always imply to me you show somebody something once or twice and they get it. Well, the problem is our children don't master things as quickly as some other children do. So I say practice and practice some more until you're probably sick of practicing, but there will be improvement. Identify their strengths, help them reframe ADHD. It's just like Lewis. He talked too much in school, but in the work world, and you'll see more about him, it has been a tremendous asset. Um, one of the things that I would like to ask you to do too is to provide ADHD education to these young teenagers and young adults. One of the strategies I use, I will say something to my son, like people with ADHD have trouble getting started. And I've noticed sometimes that that's a challenge for you. Here are a couple of ideas that might help you and you give them a choice. So what you're doing here, are two things. One is you're educating the child about ADHD. And secondly, you're giving him the tools or a compensatory strategy to address it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I asked Sean why he thought he was failing in school, he said, uh, I must be lazy. So, you know, here's the point. If you don't educate them about why they're struggling and what the ADHD challenges are, they're going to think they're lazy. Discuss and expose them to a variety of careers. As we researched our latest book, we discovered that a lot of our students with ADHD are entering college with no clue of a career path. And as a result, they flounder and they ultimately drop out. So during high school and middle school, expose them as much as you can to careers. Um, some schools offer career counseling. Uh, some people who have IEPs and transition plans will have uh, exposure through through job shadowing or different approaches. Another thing I would encourage you to do is do an interest, career interest inventory. I, Alex did that and, and what that gave us was a springboard for discussion to say, oh, it looks like you're really good at and have an interest in photography or um, in, in other areas that you see and ask him, what he thinks about that. Um, one of the other things that I realized I was doing is I would only see his negative qualities. And I had to really work on myself to make sure that I looked for the positives. <laughs> one of the things I did, what poor kid, when he came home from high school, I met him at the front door. And I didn't, my first question was always, did you remember your books and your uh, assignments rather than, hi, how was your school day? So after about two or three weeks of that, I noticed that he no longer came in the front door, that he would go down the driveway in through the garage so that he wouldn't have to face me. And I realized I needed an attitude adjustment, that I needed to be more positively focused. Here are the common academic problems our children face. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I, I do provide a lot of detail in my teaching teens book, but these are the things that may actually qualify for a learning disability. Up to 50% of our children do have learning disabilities. They have problems with verbal expression, clearly stating uh, what they, the information that they want to convey. They have problems with written expression. They have great ideas, but they can't hold them in their working memory because they have limited working memory capacity. You remember I mentioned that working memory was a problem. So this is a real challenge for him, for them. I used to let Alex dictate his ideas to me and then he would take them and work with them to um, make it into an essay. Math calculation. Oh my, how many evenings have you spent at the kitchen table with your child trying to memorize multiplication tables? I know we did. And one night I just lost it. Um, 
he came to the table and he had forgotten his homework assignment and his book. And each time that he, you know, he was supposed to be working on his homework and he would forget something and have to go to the bedroom. And after five trips of getting the, getting the book, getting the notebook and coming and sitting down, he did not know the assignment. We had to call someone. And then I'm thinking, oh, I've won this battle. And lo and behold, I look up and he's standing at the door, looking out the door. And, and I just yelled at him, right here, right now, write something. I don't care what. So, you know, part of the issue is that I didn't know that written expression was a problem for our kids. And I didn't, we didn't, ha we didn't give our young people, adults, young people, uh, medication doses later in the evening, like a five milligram of Ritalin or 10 milligram of Ritalin to help them get through homework. Because otherwise he was trying to do his homework um, without medication. Spelling is an issue. Listening comprehension, in other words, you ask them to go upstairs and put their pajamas on and brush their teeth. And by the time they've gotten to the top of the stairs, they've totally forgotten it. Reading comprehension is a problem. You can see the percentages there. Our children often say, Mom, I read the whole page and I don't remember a thing that I read. And that's, again, the working memory is so limited. Uh, some of our children have slow processing speed. That was true for my son, which means it's going to take him longer to complete classwork, homework, tests. And this needs to be noted in an IEP or a 504 plan so that the student gets extended time or uh, a shorter test. So let's talk about some of the specific executive function deficits. You know, I didn't realize that getting started was an executive function. And, and here I am yelling at my kid in the kitchen because he can't get started on his homework. So here are some things you can do. Um, Again, ex an external reminder, uh, I would talk with him and say, okay, uh, Alex, you have trouble getting started on your homework sometimes. So what if we, do you want to set a timer or do you want me to remind you? And by giving him a choice, he's more likely to comply. Um, sometimes you may have to sit with your child to get them started and then you can walk away. Uh, review the instructions with him. If it's unclear, have him call a friend. One of the other things is to break assignments into sec segments and give them a brain break in between. Um, sometimes like brainstorming with them ideas for an essay or using a graphic organizer. I'll talk more about graphic organizers in subsequent slides. Um, if you can trick yourself, t tell him. Um, say to yourself, I can read for 15 minutes and then stop. One of the teens in our teen video said, if I can only get started, once I get started, I'm fine. I can keep working. So the trick is to help them get started. Um, sometimes, for example, when I'm working on a book or a project like this, I'll print the PDF off and walk on the treadmill because as I walk, that helps my brain function better and helps me think more clearly. So, Executive function also impacts our awareness of time. I shudder to guess how many of you have children who are late <laughs> and they may say, mom, be there in five minutes and you know it's 10 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour if they come at all. But Russell Barkley tells us they have no sense of time. Here are some tips to help with this. Um, you help them compensate either like with a wristwatch alarm or an alarm on a phone or commute computer or to remind them of the time. I'm using a visual time timer right now, which tells me I have about 18 minutes left, and I'll show you what that looks like. I would practice time estimation with them. All right, think about this. They don't know that they have an impaired sense of time. So when they sit down for homework, it feels like it's going to take forever. So you could set a time timer up so that he he sees how long it will actually take for how long he's been working. Uh, 
and ask them, how long do you think this will take? And you write that down and then you reflect back to him how much it actually uh, has taken. And, and they're often surprised because they t thought it would take an hour. And, you know, it seemed like my son wasted more time avoiding getting started. But once he got started, it didn't take that long. The other thing I worked with Alex on was scheduling backwards because he was often late for school. And he would time driving from our house to the school at night when there's no traffic. So I worked with him to add in get ready time, travel time, and oops time, you know, so that, for example, he had forgotten to take into consideration that he needed time to park the car, to go in the school, to visit with friends, to get his books out of the locker, and get ready for the first class. So again, give external reminders for work, tests, or meetings, and utilize classmates or aides for prompt. My grandson would have trouble getting started, and so he asked a neighboring student to tap him. That This was his idea, his option, to tap him on the shoulder if he was distracted and he needed to write something down. And, of course, finally, I think medication has played a major role, a very positive role in my family's life with all my grandkids and kids. This is what a time timer looks like. Keep in mind that time is an abstract concept. And so what time timer does is it makes it concrete. You can see it. Um, but I should also mention that I've actually experienced deficits in executive function after I had chemotherapy. Many of you have heard of chemo brain. Well, basically what that is, is the chemo um, causes symptoms of executive function. And I happened upon a study from MD Anderson that they were using Ritalin in a small group to treat those uh, people who were having fatigue and memory problems. And when I do public speaking, as I am now, I take five milligrams of Ritalin because it helps me focus better. Uh, I lost my sense of time and it also, the chemotherapy also impaired my memory. So I am much more, sympathetic, empathetic to our young people as they cope with these challenges. Memory is an issue, another executive skill. Um, for example, if you're trying to help their memory, pictures are going to help, uh, stories about events, hands-on activities, connecting it to prior knowledge. Uh, maybe you took a trip to Paris or you took a trip to D.C. And, and tying whatever he's trying to learn into what he already knows. Elaboration, the more you talk about it, the more likely you are to remember. Mnemonics will talk more about that. And then the organization of information really helps. Um, and I will show you one of those shortly. And graphic organizers are often used. Um, this is a my sister's classroom, and by the way, she has ADHD, and she was the biology teacher of the year in Georgia one year. But she used this uh, particular um, uh, posting on the board, and she would go over it. She'd say, number one, and then she would repeat, and of course, this is so small, I can't even see what it says. Number one, absurd, and then the class would repeat it back. So. Do you see what she's doing here? You can do this at home, too, if there's something that they have to memorize so that not only are you seeing it, you're saying the words, and then you're hearing it. So you're using multiple senses. And at the end of two weeks, when they have the test, she takes it down, and guess what the students do? They look up at the board because they can see in their mind's eye where, what the words were and where they're located. So it's a wonderful uh, teaching strategy. Here's another teaching strategy for home or school. That's my sister and her science supervisor. She had her students work in pairs outside, drawing the heart and labeling each section. You know, when you do a hands-on activity like that, you will never forget it. And her students would have always the highest science biology marks in the county and sometimes in the state. But, you know, you can use sidewalk chalk at home to do something similar. 
Um, how to enhance working memory, and again, I repeat because it's so important, external reminders, and these are common sense things, good teaching strategies, memory strategies, water breaks, snack breaks, brain breaks, all of those re-energize, increase the dopamine, increase the, the glucose absorption in the brain, all of those things are very helpful. And we have also learned from research that the more difficult task, the more movement is required. For example, if all of you were in kindergarten and I wouldn't know who had ADHD as long as you were drawing or in the play areas, but once I say, come sit down and write your letters, then the children with ADHD are going to fidget. And fidgeting is a helpful thing because it increases the blood and the, and the flow of glucose and blood to the brain. So always encourage exercise and movement, and it will actually, um, John Rady, Dr. John Rady, a psychiatrist, refers to exercise as miracle growth for the brain because you can actually increase the number of neurotransmitters and brain cells. This is just an example of a math foldable. You write the words uh, of the math uh, formula and then you lift it up and, and show an example. So again, this is hands-on, it's manipulative, you're writing it down and you'll be able to see it in your mind's eye. Uh, this is a word, use of a keyword and a mnemonic. Um, for the Axis powers of World War II, you drew a graph and had an axis, and then this person was dancing a jig. Well, jig stands for Japan, Italy, and Germany, who were the key Axis powers. Being organized, one of the ways it's very helpful for teachers is to have row captains. And the row captain goes down the row initially and takes up all homework. And then at the end of the class, goes down the row and checks that everybody has written everything down. Um, you can also maybe use different folders for each class so that, uh, you know, maybe you put all finished work in, in one uh, colored folder, helping them organize the locker. Uh, but you also need to give guidance to parents at home. We never threw any papers away at home until after the semester was over because invariably I'd get a note, well, Alex didn't complete assignments one, two, and three. Well, yes, he did, but they were in his backpack and never made it to the teacher's desk. Organizational strategies, um, establish a homework routine, but give them choices. What time would you like to start? Not huge choices, but like seven or seven to fifteen, um, and where they work and clean out their book bag with them weekly to see what's missing. Um, and some of this is repetitive, so I'm going to move on. Providing them guided notes if they're working on a long-term project or a job card. Um, the good thing about, I appreciate Carly, she said she was going to take this PDF of this presentation and make it available to you all to download. So if I go through things quickly, then you will know for, um, you know, you'll have uh, these to refer back to. Uh, with study skills, create a practice exam. My teacher, my sister always did that, and then they would review it, and so it was a great review for the test. Don't cram, and right before bed, read over, uh, skim over the notes about your test. Um, and that's true for me. The last thing I did last night was I reviewed this presentation, and your brain works on it. Memory is consolidated while you're sleeping. And that's why it's critically important for our children to get good restful sleep. The other thing you may not have thought of is sugary drinks like Gatorade or apple juice can help while they're working on their schoolwork. But they should sip it, not guzzle it, because it will increase the, the glucose, the sugar, that ends up going to the brain and helps you think more clearly. And of course, brain breaks are always important. Avoiding the dreaded homework battles. Oh my gosh, you know, we had some of the most awful fights at our house over homework. 
Our son wasn't on medicine we didn't understand about executive function. We didn't realize he had learning disabilities. So here are some tips for homework completion. Uh, writing down the assignments, either another student writes it down for everybody and prints it off uh, and then gives it to each of the students who's likely to be forgetful. Um, some of these I've already mentioned. Some students walk to the board and take a photocopy, uh, a picture with their phone of the uh, assignment. There's also this lovely software now that a lot of schools are using is Remind, and the teacher at school sends home the assignment in addition to, um, to the parent and the student. Uh, emailing, I always would ask, go to school and ask about the homework pattern um, and, and have an extra book at home. So these are just some ideas that could help. Here's an example of the Remind um, app. This is important too. I would ask you, suggest that you establish a launch pad near the door. And at night, they put everything away, all their homework and their book back, and then put it in this place. So if you need gym shoes or whatever. So it's a visual reminder. Avoiding long-term disaster with uh, long-term projects. This is a very important slide. Um, Russell Barkley says, if, if you have ADHD and I ask you have an event and a response and an outcome, if I say to you, I want you to write three sentences about what you've learned today and turn it in before you leave. Our children with ADHD can do that. But if I said to you and you had ADHD and I said, I want you to write three sentences during this next week and give it to me next Monday. And what Barclay says is when you create a time lag, you disable the child. And that's why our children have such a difficult time with long-term projects. They forget it um, and, you know, then they fail the class because they forgot it. So this is something I would encourage you to include that you be notified of any long-term projects uh, in the IP or 504 plan. Completing long-term projects, these are just some tips here that may be helpful, breaking it into segments, uh, practicing scheduling time backwards, providing a job card, providing a graphic organizer, and I'm about to show you an example of that. Um, and it helps to show completed models or projects or reports. This is an A paper, this is a B paper, this is a C paper. And from doing this, the students will figure out, well, I'm gonna aim for this. I see what I need to do. So again, the visual cues are very helpful. This is just a sample of a project graphic organizer out of my teaching teens book. Uh, what they found here is that um, the teacher did a whole page, single space, small font instructions and the mother and the son went through and put it in this, the, it's like outlining it, but he put it in this graphic organizer. And then we also, she also used the weekly planner. If it's due on a Friday, then you think, okay, it's gonna take two weeks to do it. And you kind of, you divide the assignment into sections so that he will work on a different section every t each day. But one of the things that we found in our research is that sometimes we had a premature launch of our kids with ADHD and the data confirms that 70 to 80 percent of our kids with ADHD drop out of college and part of it is because they aren't developmental ready developmentally ready and they often start with no clue of a career path and what, what is interesting to me is that if you have family support, in other words, if you're going to community college and still living at home, you are more likely to be successful in college. And But for those kids who go away to college, the lack of that family support results often in school failure and then dropping out. And our kids who don't graduate actually earn less than people who never went to college. These are scary guidelines. So here are some things that you can do and I'm running low on time, um, observe uh, their interests, you know, if they're good at music, art, sports, public speaking, computers, robotics, whatever, 
get them involved in that. And I would suggest you never use it as punishment to take away if they've done something bad or that you're not happy about, because these are the things that keep them going um, and are building skills that will be valuable once they're out of school. Um, at school, uh, invite speakers from a variety of, of careers. So those are just some ideas. Um, a young woman here in this community has a gap year. This is a new term, fairly new term. And what she does is she takes a course at the college. She teaches uh, fourth, uh, four and five-year-olds ballet. Uh, she's a facilitator for a group, co-facilitator for a group in the high school. And she has been on numerous uh, ADHD panels with us, particularly about uh, under diagnosis of girls and women, and she wants to be a psychologist. So, but here's the good news about gap years. 90% go to college within a year of the gap year. You know, some people fear, well, if they do a gap year, um, that they will never go back. Uh, they report personal growth, greater confidence, and they actually outperform students who went straight to college from right out of high school. Uh, Someone asked an earlier question about medication, and here's when medication is working and you're on the right medication, these are the changes that you should see. And if you don't see them, something is wrong. And, and particularly around the uh, middle school years, uh, they're growing, their hormones are changing, and you may need to adjust or increase the medicine. If it's not working, it may be, and, and that sneaks up on you. I've had experts in ADHD, he said, well, my son's not doing well, and I'm going, how old is he? So anyway, that explains why they were still struggling. But this last slide I want to share with you is, again, this is uh, research that has been confirmed by multiple sources. When children with ADHD take medication, their brains mature faster than those who don't take meds. And here's why. Medication doesn't change the brain. Medication allows the child to listen and learn. And the learning experience changes the brain. So for example, if Carol um, and I both had ADHD and she took medicine, her brain is gonna mature faster than mine because I'm ornery or didn't wanna take it or didn't like how it made me feel. But the child who takes medications, brain is maturing more quickly. All right, just a couple of other things, and then, you know, it's really time for me to wrap up. Uh, the most important message that I'm delivering you today is maintaining the relationship with your child above all else. It is more important than school. It is more important than anything else because one day it may save their lives. I know this from experience. We almost lost two of our children to suicide in their teen years. Thankfully, they weren't successful. They are doing well today. But here's what my son said to me after his girl broke up with his girlfriend and lost his driver's license. He said, it's hard to share. Mom, I just like to go to sleep and never wake up. But I know how much you love me and how much this would hurt you if I did that. So we both cried and then made adjustments to try to help him. So I want to wrap up, though, after that sad note on a positive note. Here is, here is my son and his friends. They both are doing well. They all struggled in high school. Uh, this is Lewis. I promised there would be more about him. Lewis is um, the entertainer for the Atlanta Gladiators, uh, and he loves to talk. He's been a DJ. Um, he does, uh, I don't know, in the lower picture on the right, if you can tell, but he's sitting with Clark Howard, who is a famous financial advisor. And in the top one, he is the crowd entertainer for Polaris, uh, the Razor, you know, four wheels. This is over my head. I don't understand exactly what it is, but it's a big deal to people who love four wheels. And just very quickly, here's Chris. Uh, he is a jazz musician. He struggled as a kid. And he's been on Saturday Night Live. Amelia is a beloved teacher and extraordinary tape maker. Kyle is not a college graduate, but he is a Microsoft 
project manager. Uh, Max is the first professional black triathlete. Christopher is a park ranger. Nathan, my grandson, is the Tennessee sales director for Monday Night Brewing. Uh, he is an expert on beers, for better or worse. And the picture in the center simply shows the three of them on our team video. And then our final words of wisdom, educate the team about the challenges, practice compensatory strategies, give accommodations, build on strengths, and if they are anxious or have LD, get treatment. Right now, I'm working on a new presentation on basic everyday things you can do to address anxiety. Moving on, give the teens the gift of time. Be patient with them. You're going to have to provide support longer than you wanted to or that you think you should, but you need to do that. Provide a safety net. And finally, although it's not written here, protect and treasure your relationship with your child. By working together, you will get there. God bless and best wishes. Wow, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences, for your uplifting and heartwarming presentation. We've learned so much um, and we know that wasn't easy and we just appreciate your genuine and authentic um, experiences and sharing that with us. Um, before we start the q and I'd like to thank Equizon Pro once more for sponsoring this webinar. So we got lots of questions, as you might imagine. Um, I'll start <laughs> with this one. Um, my son is 13, he's in middle school, and he's attended five different schools since starting uh, preschool. Uh, the biggest hurdle is teacher education. Do you have any suggestions on how best to explain to mainstream educators um, what children with ADHD might be going through and how they can best um, address and cope with these um, issues? Um, I have written an article and you can actually download it uh, from my website, but it's about executive function. I have actually two documents that might be helpful. What we find helpful most often is like one or two short documents, like I have one, 10 key facts about ADHD. And then the second one is something to the effect of executive function, what is it? And in it, I talk about how it impacts academic performance. The other thing I would suggest you do is to find the person who is the kind heart uh, at, the high, at the school where your son goes. It may be the guidance counselor. You know, with 10% of people having ADHD, there's some teacher at that school who is a child with ADHD and is dealing with the same issues. So find your sympathetic ear, vice principal, principal, so, uh, social worker, or guidance counselor, and see if they have suggestions of ways you can help. Um, sometimes, too, we have our little blue book um, uh, that is called A Bird's Eye View of Life. And it's a very easy read. Russell Barkley has endorsed it. It has uh, cartoons, and that could be very helpful. You know, I, I mean, I'm not a, the kind of person who's going to push uh, my products on you, but, you know, I've lived it. And what I did is every stage, there was no book for teenagers, so I wrote that. There was no, no, no book for teenagers. The first one was no books on teenagers. And so I really want you to have this information. Um, it, this may not be appropriate, but if you email me, I'll be happy to sell you one of the blue books for like five five books and, and postage to cover, and it probably isn't appropriate. I'm sorry, Carol. I don't know if you can blip that out, but my main <laughs> thing is I want to help people. Yeah, and you do, Chris, um, and it comes through, and we appreciate that. Um, um, so we have another question. How do you help your child deal with the self-esteem challenges that come when they have to work so much harder than other students and they get grades that just don't reflect their effort? Well, I would do a couple of, suggest a couple of things. One is to pull them toward things that they are successful in. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's music, maybe it's theater. 
and then figure out, take that ADHD iceberg and iceberg blank and see what's causing their problems. And, you know, we all wish that when our child is in middle school that we wouldn't have to sit with them. But the truth of the matter is that you may have to become a second teacher or find a high school or college student in your neighborhood who will sit down with him and help him go through it. He is not, stop and think with me, he is not going to remember all his assignments. And he's probably, <laughs> I remember one of our sons went up to his room, was studying for final exams, and he came down after 15 minutes. He said, I'm so tired. I've been studying so hard. So they have no sense of that. And so having someone to sit with them or work with them, or another strategy is to have him work on his assignments with another student who's a friend who's maybe doing a little better than he is. You know, sadly, there are no magic answers, but you have to keep working, you know, again, identifying why he's struggling and, you know, look at the iceberg and the blank iceberg and see if you can figure out what it is, or if not, find a teacher who in previous years has been helpful and ask them for suggestions. Um, this person writes, my child is 2E gifted and has ADHD. He's medicated and doesn't require an IEP or 504 plan now. Do you think it's best that he get one before college? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the thing is, the way the law reads, and I'm not the best expert on this, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to be failing a class to be eligible for services. And there may be some services that he may need, but in college, it's going to get tougher. I would talk to the guidance counselor and say, um, at a minimum, I would like to have a 504 that documents that he uh, is 2E and that uh, he does have ADHD. But there may be um, you know, a lot of times when our kids are doing well, it's because we're sitting with them at the kitchen table every night. And once he goes away to school, you're not going to be there. So I guess this parent needs to decide. In other words, our children often do well because of the extra supports and teaching we provide them at home. And that has to be taken into consideration. You know, I know a family here, and the mother says, I have to work with him every night. They were trying to say he didn't uh, deserve a, a, a 504. She had been to my training, and she, she sat next to the superintendent. So she called the superintendent and said, my son needs a 504. So within the week, it was done. You know, I do a lot of free public training here. I hope that helps. And if, if I don't give you enough of an answer, email me. And if I can help you, I certainly will. We had um, several questions um, that um, were, for the most part, asking, what can you do with a teenager? Um, one said their child was in 12th grade, um, who their teenagers are resistant to help, help from the teacher in class, help mm -hmm. from their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't know how to move forward. And some say their ego, the child's ego is involved. Well, you know, my son was gifted and he did not want help. He didn't want to be different. Um, at some point, okay, this is one of those that there's not an easy answer for. I, I've got to think about this, how you could help. Um, it, 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 for example, does he have a doctor that he respects? Um, is there an older uncle or a relative who has ADHD who might talk to him? And, you know, even is he, you know, I would wonder if he's taking medication. If he's not, you know, Alex's doctor was wonderful. And um, Alex would listen to him and follow his advice before he would mind. And um, it just depends on what you're what you're trying to do. What you know, if he's getting by on his own, then maybe that has to be good enough because grades aren't necessarily going to be a pro projector. 
uh, a projection of uh, success in life, but working to make sure that he is, his self-esteem is really good. Um, and sometimes you say things like, you know, you can't make them do what you want them to do like you were when they were little. So, you know, um, when Alex went away to college, I said, son, I'll help you in any way that you want me to. Um, and um, I'll, otherwise, I'll leave you alone. And then I said, I sneaked in. Well, if you wouldn't mind, send me a, a syllabus of what your classes are. And then, of course, I would see the syllabus and I would go, I would call him the night before and I'd go, good luck on your test tomorrow. And what I was really doing is he would have no clue he had a test tomorrow. So, you know, I just wish I had a, a more thoughtful answer. Um, I guess you could lay it out to him something like, well, if you need help, we're here for you. I mean, if he's not failing any courses, you know, when I found I was a straight A student and I wanted Alex to be a clone of me, but sometimes you just have to accept him where he is. And I'm sorry, that's a meandering, pretty terrible answer, but I think that it is a, an incredibly difficult challenge. And, and I hate that you're dealing with it. Like I say, if you want to email me, um, let me know. I'll be glad to brainstorm with you. I don't have, in some ways, enough information. You know, is he really struggling um, or is he getting by? Right, right. Uh, that was a great answer. You made a lot of great points and um, gave some advice to follow and things to think about. Um, one parent asked, how much should I be involved in helping my student in high school with ADHD? Um, you know, on one hand, he needs to learn independence, but I don't want him to be doing poorly either. Um, how do you find a good balance? Well, you do what it takes, whatever it takes to help him succeed. Um, you know, one year when Alex was a freshman, he was failing six or seven classes and I stepped in and he was able to recover six of the seven, but he passed and I thought, aha. He'll fail, and he'll go to summer school, and he'll learn. But the problem is our children don't learn from uh, punishment rewards like other children. And what I have found, if you let them fail so significantly, they get in a hole, they never come back because they're discouraged easily. You know, I hate the term helicopter parent or codependence and all those words that were really more related to addiction abuse, um, give yourself permission to be involved and help him. But you're at the same time monitoring your behavior and you keep um, allowing them to do um, take on more and more responsibility as much as they can. This, this is almost like um, um, potty training. We want our kids to be potty trained as soon as they can, but until their brain and body maturity is ready, it's not going to happen. So I would just, you know, casually continue to work with him. A mom called me up one time and she said, I don't want to be a helicopter parent, but my daughter has failed math twice. Do I just let her fail again? And I said, no, give yourself permission to be involved. And the creative solution they came up with is mom took the math class with her and they worked as partners and she passed. So don't let others embarrass you. They don't understand our kids. They haven't lived in our shoes. And if you need to be more involved, give yourself permission. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So that has to be the last question. Um, but thank you, Chris, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with our ADHD community. Next week, our free webinar is titled, When ADHD Triggers Emotional Outbursts, Scripts for Your Flashpoints with Dr. Sharon Saline. We hope you can join us. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thank you. Thank you.